yeah, the energy transition in Germany. I think it's it's perhaps interesting to to hear that for you, um, not so much in the sense that one can easily take over the example in one country by another country, but I think we, we face all the same global problems and to see how we as a highly industrialized country try to address the issue um, could, could be of interest to you. We, we have that process that we call the energy transition in Germany. And basically, it's, it's the attempt to, to go from a highly fossil-based economy to, to an economy which is to a very high percentage. In the end state, 2050, around 80% based on, on renewables. The rationale behind this, it is, I think, is, is obvious. Um, Fossil energy by its nature is limited, is restricted, while renewables, again by definition, is an energy source that, that is renewable, that is sustainable. So in, in that process, we try to move the energy sources in this direction. The, the attempt is made in, in order to minimize the many external costs that fossil fuels, fossil energy sources have. And these are, I think, costs which are often forgotten. It's ecological costs, environmental cost, costs, social costs that are often not put into the calculation when we see how much we have to spend for different energy sources. And again, it's obvious that in view of, of global warming, we, we have to start a process of decarbonizing. And it's also obvious that there is a particular responsibility um, in the industrialized countries. Not only there, but of course, in particular, also there. Another, another motivation, obviously, is that renewables mean that we reduce the dependence on energy imports, and traditionally that dependence has been very high in a country like Germany, which has not very many commodities in its own soil, with the exception, of course, of lignite and hard coal, but, but otherwise we do not have many energy sources ourselves. This process has to fulfill three criteria. It has to be environmentally sound, it has to be secure and reliable, and it has to be affordable and cost-effective. And, and so far, I think we are on good track when we look at uh, the criteria that it should be secure and reliable. Um, the overall time of interruptions in the, in the energy system in last year was 12 minutes per year in the whole year. Um, something which ESCOM still strives to get to. Um, and th there are three steps, basically, in, in that concept. The first step, and I think that's also an aspect which is often forgotten, is, is efficiency first, to increase energy efficiency. Increase it by improving the heating system in houses, um, isolation in houses and, and other aspects. And, and only if, if um, this does not cover um, necessary reductions, we have a look to the direct use of renewables. And, and we, we also have to look into sector coupling, meaning it's not only about electricity, but of course also about heating, about cooling, about transport. And, and we will see that a little bit later. Um, we often talk when we, we talk about energy consumption, about electricity, and, and the main part of, of the problem, of course, lies also with, with heating and with mobility. Um, and, and we will see the data. We are th I think we do pretty well when it comes to electricity. We, we do far less well when it comes to heating and in particular to mobility. 
Now, the energy transition, it's a, it's a long-term process, as I said. We, we have goals till 2050. Um, now, one must admit 2050 is a long time in the future. Um, I don't want to be cynical, but perhaps not everyone in the room will um, be around to check whether we reach the goals. Um, but the, the goal is to go down with greenhouse gases in comparison to 1990 by 40% in 2020 and come to 80 to 95% in 2050. We, we have been uh, at the rate of a reduction of 27% last year, so we are on, on good track, but we are not exactly at the 40% yet. I think where, where we are doing well is, is uh, when you see the the second, the light blue column, gross electricity consumption. We are, we are now at 37% renewables in Germany. Um, and you see, again, the goal to come from 35% in 2020. We are already there um, to 80% in, in 2050. Um, so you, you see that in a highly industrial society like ours, economy like ours, it is possible to, to reach the level of more than a third uh, of energy produced uh, through renewable sources. And renewable sources already today have a higher importance for us than lignite, hard coal, nuclear energy. The pr production and addition already now exceeds the consumption. As I said earlier, it has grown in all sectors. Electricity now, 36%. Heating and transport mobility is lagging behind with 13 and 5% respectively. There, I think, is work to be done. Um, but overall, wind by now covers 18%. Um, solar covers 6%. Um, hydro, 3%. Um, and the capacities have steadily grown. Um, we have now 50,000 megawatts of wind energy, 43,000 of solar energy. And uh, if, if you know Germany and the German climate, perhaps some of you are surprised that we can have that share of solar energy in the country. But, but I think if, if you ever have been in Germany in November and you see that these data are possible, um, you, might, you might think uh, if, you can, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. Um, so, and and uh, all the more so in a country, of course, like South Africa, uh, which, which I think is ideally suited for the use of solar and wind, wind energy. We do this all, the energy transition, in a, in a time, at a time when, at the same time, we try to phase out nuclear energy. Um, it's a very long debate in Germany, but eventually, especially after the Fukushima disaster, um, the government has decided to phase out nuclear energy by 2022. Already by now, 57% of nuclear energy sources are retired, and the remaining seven will, will retire by, by um, 2022. And that has to do with, with uh, an assessment about the external costs, about the problems of nuclear waste and, and the risk that potential accidents could possibly have. Now, I don't want to get in this debate. I know it's, it's highly, um, it can get highly emotional and um, there are different aspects, but this is a decision that, that we, we took. I think one important aspect, and that um, builds up somewhat, and I come to, a bit to that later, it builds up on what Mr. Vavi said, um, the process to involve all stakeholders. Um, energy transition concerns very many people, um, business, government, and of course, society and labor. So we, we need a process in all this transition process in which you involve all stakeholders that we, we try to do by 
by building, by establishing um, commissions for the energy transition. Now, I don't want to, to bore you with the details, but just to, to make that, that point. To, to come back to, to the question of, of the global size of the problem. Um, and I said already, it is largely um, caused by industrialized countries. If you look at the charts, um, the distribution of regional per capita carbon dioxide emissions um, over the population differs, of course, largely by different countries. And you see that especially some OECD countries um, on the left of the chart are, have a far, far higher uh, per capita carbon emission than countries in the global south. You see at the end that actually the share of sub-Saharan Africa is comparatively small. That said, as you probably know, the numbers, the data for South Africa looks somewhat different. South Africa has carbon emissions per person per capita, which remind more to the countries uh, of the industrialized world. But I think this, this data um, demonstrates how dramatically global emissions would rise if all countries were to have per capita emissions at the level of some OECD countries. And, and to, to give you just one example, um, without wanting to criticize anyone, but in the US, roughly four out of every five inhabitants own a car. In the European Union, it's still 55%. In India, it's only 3%. In China, it's probably around 14% now. But if, for example, India were to increase the number of cars per inhabitant to the US level, that would mean an additional 987 million cars with the obvious effects for the emissions and the climate. One, one aspect, and, and there I refer to what Professor Swilling has, has said, is um, the process of energy transition in Germany is broadly accepted by the population. Um, if asked if you support energy transition, you get these answers of, of 89%. And, and when you ask why is that, um, I, I do think it has to do with that inclusiveness of the process. Um, it has to do with, with the fact that um, there has been sufficient communication that people understand. We have a global problem and we have to contribute to that. Um, I think it has to do with the fact that the costs of energy have not increased to a large scale. And it has to do with the fact that the overall uh, balance, overall balance in jobs has not been negative. I think these are all Im important aspects and, and if you see now, um, already now about a, a fifth of the German population own um, household items which are relevant in terms of energy transition like solar uh, photovoltaics, um, electric vehicles, solar thermal installations. So, so there's really that buy-in. There's a strong importance of cooperate, cooperatives that Professor Swilling has mentioned, but, but really the, the buy-in of, of a large part of, of the population. I already mentioned the, the necessity of, of the dialogue in society, um, and at the same time, in this energy transition process, yes, we try to phase out coal as well. And that has been a long, long debate in Germany. It's not an easy decision. Coal has been the backbone of our industrial development over the past 200 years. And it's still a highly organized industry. Um, and we, as I mentioned, we do not have naturally so many commodities. So lignite, for example, is among the few. We have the, the intention now to, to phase out of coal by 2038. And you will easily notice that's quite a, quite a time in the future. 
and, and I think that also comes back somewhat to what Mr. Vavi said. It's, it's about the process of organizing the transition of involving people, involving stakeholders, and have everyone on the table to find a solution that's acceptable to everyone. We have in, in coal and lignite in Germany about 20,000 people still working there. Now that is in a country of 82 million, perhaps not such a high number. But part of, of the lignite production is in regions which are economically rather weak. And if you talk about 20,000, of course you have a supply industry, you have families that are involved, so, so you, easily, you easily get to a couple of tens of thousands of people who are concerned by that process. So yes, obviously that is necessary, the process. There is the urgency to, to reduce our carbon emissions, but at the same time, it is even for us a relatively strong economy, a long-term and difficult process in which everyone involved has to sit on the table to find solutions acceptable to, to everyone. Now, to, to summarize, I, th I think the major message is um, energy transition is possible in a highly industrialized country. It is possible to transform the energy and power section to a more sustainable um, system. And given the global data, there is no alternative. We, we have to do that. So we are at 38% now. And people see we have 38% share of renewables. The lights don't go out. The costs don't go up through the ceiling. They remain stable. And the whole process has positive effects on job creation and innovation. I think one cannot deny, though, that it was possible and still is possible that you have an active state support for this system. It cannot be done exclusively by private industry. Um, but, but I think all in all, it's a global issue. I presented now what we try to do in Germany. Um, but, but I think both North and South, um, we all have to wor work together to, to do something very serious to tackle global warming, and we hope with these efforts we can try to contribute to that process. Thank you very much. Okay.